Thanks, thanks, Avi. Yeah, Microsoft is not going to appear too much in this uh, presentation except, except for the first slide. Um, but yeah, I'm going to tell you about uh, set chasing. So I'm really happy to be speaking here. You know, I wish I could be in person, of course, but that would be for another time. The last time I talked at the IAS, I think, was uh, 10 years ago. So I will try to basically bring you up to speed on what I did in the last uh, 10 years. But more than that, really, I would like to you know, try to have you learn something interesting. So this set chasing problem, I think, is a gen very general problem. And also the way we solve it using mirror descent, which is a, a Riemannian version of gradient descent, I think this could have many more applications. There will be some, you know, entropy and evolving entropy. So lots of interesting objects that will appear in this presentation. Please interrupt me with questions. Uh, the material, as you can imagine, will get technical pretty quickly. And so it's really important that you follow, you know, basically every side. So please, please interrupt me and ask me questions. So this is what I will uh, try to cover. So it's a story that started, you know, a little bit more than 10 years ago when I was working on online learning. And I will adopt some of the terminology of online learning. I don't assume anybody uh, here necessarily knows about online learning, but, but those, this terminology is, uh, you know, um, very simple, so I, I will explain that. So this started 10 years ago for this uh, online shortest pass from a regret perspective. And then the real story started the phase one uh, that I call is when I worked on K-Server with Michael Cohen, James Lee, Intat Lee, and Alexander Madry. Uh, and then after that, we did the convex body chasing with Boaz Kartag, Intat Lee, Yuan Jiri, and Mark Selke. And finally, what I will kind of focus on in this presentation is this last phase, which was my pandemic uh, project with Yuval Rabani and uh, Christian Koester, uh, which is this problem called uh, layered graph traversal introduced by Papa Dimitriou and Yanakakis 30 years ago. And we basically solved it in, in, in my perspective very easily using mirror descent. I will explain all of this. Okay, so let's start with online shortest paths. This is gonna be you know, our guiding light uh, for the presentation. So in machine learning, I, I say machine learning theory, but in fact, also in, in real machine learning, this is a problem that we love a lot. So online shortest pass works like this. There is a fixed graph and there is a source and a target. And every day, what you want to do is to choose a pass from the source to the target. So you know, every day you have to, I don't know, bike from home to work and you have to choose you know, the route that you're gonna take to, to do that. But what you don't know is that you don't know the delays on the edges for that day. So you don't know the weight function from the set of edges to R plus. This is unknown to you. And so you have to plan under this uncertainty. And what we're gonna do in this uh, online shortest pass from an ML perspective is that we're gonna play a repeated game where every day we have to choose you know, another pass. And what we want is eventually that our total delay is good compared to the best we could have done in hindsight if we had chosen a fixed route. Okay, so this is called the regret. So for now, almost uh, 20 years, or in fact, exactly 20 years, we know for this problem how to control the regret. So let me tell you again what is a regret. You play this game for capital T days, capital T days, okay? So each day you choose an ST pass, and now you compute what was the total length that you have traveled over this uh, span of capital T days, and you compare yourself to the best you could have done in hindsight. If you knew in advance the set of weight functions that you were gonna face, there was a best fixed ST pass, and what you can guarantee is that there exists an algorithm which will get this length of the best ST path in hindsight plus a term which is a smaller order term. So imagine, you know, uh, the best fixed path. You can imagine that its total length over the capital T days is going to be some constant times capital T. And what you're going to do is the same constant times capital T plus something of smaller order of order square root T. Okay. So it's a smaller order term and there is some polynomial factor in the size of the graph. All right. Now, this is not uh, what I'm going to focus on in this presentation. What I'm going to focus on is a more difficult version of this problem, which, which was studied and introduced even before, so 30 years ago, by Papa Dimitri and Yanakakis. So in that version, what happens is that both the graph and the weight are unknown. And we're not going to really play a repeated game, but rather the graph itself is going to be you know, the space over which you play this repeated game, and the, the graph is going to be revealed sequentially. So let me explain this very simply. So again, you have a source and a target, but you don't know the graph beforehand. And the graph is going to be revealed to you in a breast first search way. OK, so you have the source. Now all the vertices connected to the source are revealed. Now you have to move. OK, you have to make a move. You have to move towards the target. Now, all the vertices connected you know, to the vertices that were connected to the source are revealed. 
So you can imagine that it's a layered graph. It's revealed layer by layer. Okay, so the first layer is revealed, you move to a, a vertex in the first layer. The second layer is revealed, you move to a, a, a vertex in the second layer, and so on and so forth. Okay, and what we're going to parameterize this problem by is not the size of the graph, but rather the width, which is the maximal number of vertices revealed per step. Okay, so if you want, it's kind of you know kind of the degree of the of the graph. Okay, and this is going to be denoted by k. Let me yes question. Okay, sorry, I can wait till you're finished with the slide, but yeah, I have. A yeah, of yeah. Maybe, maybe wait two more minutes and then and then you know I, I expect there will be questions. Yeah. So here is a picture you know uh, of of what they had in mind. So really, they were motivated by uh, actually robotics uh, application, and you know they mentioned AI in the first paragraph of their paper. So this, imagine that you are a robot, you know, exploring an unknown room. You start at the entrance at the source and you want to get out of the room T. And it's going to be like in a video game, you know, the room is going to be revealed to you frame by frame. And as it's revealed, you have to move, you have to keep moving in the room. Okay. So imagine you are the source, you know, and you want to exit. So you, you move straight and then this wall is revealed to you. So now you cannot keep moving straight. So, you know, there is a wall and you want to get to the next layer. So maybe you go down and you go here, but you see now I have incurred some extra movement. You know, if I knew there was a wall and I wanted to get here, I could have gone in straight line, but instead I went straight and then down and then, you know, right. So I have some extra movement due to the uncertainty, due to the fact that I didn't know the room. Okay. Uh, so maybe now is a, is a good time to take a question. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I don't know. I didn't understand even the first one. I don't know if I should even, uh, are you going to be talking more about the first one, or should I just not worry about that? Uh, you <laughs> don't have to worry about it, but I'm happy to answer a question if you have one. Okay, so might as well, might as well ask one. Yeah, so in that case, so it's not the there's not a fixed graph with underlying weights. It's like like the function. So, so yeah, in the in the first one, there is a fixed graph. In the first version of the problem at the top of the slide, there is a fixed graph, but the weight function is changing every day. Changes every day. Okay, and then yeah. uh, so when you say uh, th does that mean that um, for every t uh, after? Yes, for every for for every time step, you know, uh, there is going to be a, a different w function. Um, but but you know, uh, let me just say this slide is a motivational slide, you know, and and the point is what I'm going to tell you the the strategy that, that I will tell you solves those problems optimally. But I'm going to define the problem, you know, much more carefully than what I'm doing on this slide. So this is, you know, to get you, you have to be kind of inspired by this slide, but you don't necessarily need to, you know, understand all the exact details. It, they don't matter too much for the rest of the presentation. Okay, and then one more thing. So it really is a breadth first search. It's like you, you you're somewhere you start somewhere, and then the all the vertices that are distance one to are revealed, and then all of their neighbors are revealed. Yeah. But understand, uh, yes, absolutely. But understand, distance one is, uh, you know, combinatorial distance, not the weighted distance. So it's a weighted graph, right? And so some edges could be, you know, longer than other edges. What's the what? Uh, what's the model that you're? Um... Right. E excellent. So it's going to be an adversarial model, and what I'm going to allow as uh, you know the algorithm, I'm going to be randomized. So you will so the, define it. You will define it more formally now. I I, I will define a, a much more general version of the problem, which is the set chasing problem. Ah, okay. So before that, I mean, you are revealing not the whole, each layer in turn. You are revealing only the neighbors of the. No, 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 no. I'm revealing each layer completely. So really, like a video game. You know, doesn't matter so where you are. Like, I see, but it's then it's not like. A, the degree, the width is not the degree. The width is just uh, you know the maximum possible number of right, 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 right. Yeah, 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 you're right. Not connected to you right now. Absolutely, hundred percent. Yes, okay. totally. Yes. You haven't told us what the problem is that you're gonna. Yeah. yeah no, no. I haven't said what, what I'm gonna do now. So what I'm gonna do exactly? Yes. So what I'm gonna do is that now you know we we're gonna explore this graph and we're gonna you know take. So there is, in hindsight, there is a shortest path from S to T in this room. And what we will want is to compare ourselves to this shortest path. So, you know, our algorithm will have, will have traveled much more, you know. Maybe, you know, I, I face this wall and maybe I make a wrong decision and I go up. And then I, I face this wall and I go down. And, you know, 
like it's gonna i'm gonna you know traverse the graph and so this is called layered graph traversal and my traversal is going to be longer a priori than the shortest sd pass and what i will want you know you might ask because you've seen you know the the top of the slide you might ask okay can you do as well as this shortest pass plus a little bit but that's too much to ask for okay so you cannot ask for regret but what you can ask for is competitive ratio so what you want is an algorithm which is guaranteed that the total distance it has traveled is less than that of the shortest pass times the multiplic multiplicative factor that only depends on k. Okay, and let me say right away, it's not at all obvious that such a thing exists. I mean, you know, for all you know, like maybe it's impossible. Like maybe when the graph gets bigger, the dependency, de you know, is on the size of the graph. But it turns out to be uh, possible. And what this presentation will be about is that there exists a single algorithm, which is mere descent but appropriately decorated, that solves both of those problems optimally, and in fact solves a much more general problem, which is this uh, set chasing. And let me just explain why, you know, maybe it will give you a little bit of intuition on the problem, why you cannot hope to get small regret. You know, imagine you have the source. And it spawns two child. Okay, so you have two vertices that are connected to it. Maybe both of them are distance one. So you, as you know, the uh, searcher in this graph, you have to move to one of those two vertices. Okay, it doesn't matter which one you move to. You move to one of them. Now imagine that it's a deterministic algorithm, so the adversary knows exactly what the algorithm is doing. So now what the, the adversary is going to do is that the adversary is going to put an edge of length one on the vertex where you are, and an edge of length zero on the other vertex. So the other vertex, you know, keeps moving forward in the graph at, at zero cost. You know, its distance to the source does not increase. But the searcher, it, if it stays on the branch that it's currently exploring, it keeps moving away. You know, it keeps having distances of one. So at some point, you know, it's like when you are at the supermarket and you see the other line, which is moving faster than you. At some point, you're like, OK, I have to switch line, you know. But of course, as soon as you switch line, then that's when, you know, the edges of length one starts hitting you and the other lines you know move very fast at, at cost zero so you see you're going to keep moving back and forth so eventually you're going to do at least twice more than what the best shortest path was okay so you cannot hope to have small regret but you can maybe hope to have a small not small but some multiplicative constant okay so that's what we're going to do all right, so again, this was um, like the least precise uh, slide of the presentation. So now things are going to be uh, more precise. And let me backtrack quite a bit and talk about selection and selector. OK, so we're, we're now you know, going to be on, on firmer ground. So let's start with a very, very fundamental object that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, which is a selector. So what is a selector? A selector is defined like this. You are given a set system S. And a selector is a map with the following property. It maps any element in this set system, any set capital S in script S. When you input that into your selector, it outputs an element of that set. OK, it selects. It selects element in sets. OK, and this selector is defined based on some set system defined a priori. OK, so of course, you know, all of you know, the axiom of choice is all about the existence of such a selector in general, OK? Now, we don't care about the axiom of choice. You know, we're not here to do logic. What we care about is the, the case where the ground set has some extra structure. And then if the ground set has some extra structure, you know, I don't know, maybe, you know, it's a measurable space. And then maybe you will want this selector to be itself measurable. You know, as soon as you add structure on the ground set, you can ask, can I have a selector which is a nice selector? And for us, what we're going to care about what, is the case. Is the set? Sorry, say again. What is a ground set? What is a ground set? Uh, uh, sorry, yes, this was not uh, made precise. So my sets are made of elements. These elements they live in the in what I call the ground set. Okay. Okay. That's sorry. Thanks. Thanks for the question. So for us, the ground set, capital X, is going to be a metric space. You know, this is what we're going to care about, and this is what we care about very often in computer science. So we have a weighted graph, okay, or just more, more generally a, a metric space. And in that case, if you have a metric space, you have a notion of distance, it's very natural to equate, you know, a nice selector with being a Lipschitz selector. So what does it mean? It means that if my set changes a little bit, 
then I want my selected point to change a little bit. Okay, so of course you, the selected point is just a metric on the ground set, and for the metric on the sets, well, there is a very natural notion which is the house of distance, and I will remind you in a second what is a house of distance. So now you know all you want that your selector satisfies is that the distance between selected points when I present the set A and when I present the set B is less than some constant, the Lipschitz constant L, times the house of distance between the set A and the set B. So if the, again, if the set A and B are epsilon close, then the selected point are L times epsilon close. Okay? So this is house of smooth selection. I think an extremely natural problem. Let me remind you what is house of distance and kind of the algorithmic version, and maybe you will see you know, that it's kind of connected to the first slide. So the house of distance is defined like this. It is simply the smallest distance that I need if I'm starting from a point in A and I want to get into B, and I'm now taking the worst case starting point, okay? So it's the smallest distance I need to travel from A to B starting from the worst case starting point in A. And because we're in an offline problem, A and B, you know, there is no order over them. So you symmetrize over A and B. That's, that's the definition of the house of distance, okay? So now, of course, at this point, very natural to ask, you know, what is the link between layered graph traversal and Hausdorff smooth selection? And I claim that layered graph traversal is nothing but an online version of Hausdorff smooth selection. Hausdorff smooth selection is kind of the offline version of the problem. And in, in layered graph traversal, it's going to be an online version where you have a sequence of sets that's coming. And every time you see a new set, you have to select a point in it. Then there is another set coming. You select a point in it, and so on and so forth. Okay. So now I'm going to define this online house of smooth selection, which uh, I call set chasing, or we call, or what is called uh, set chasing. Okay. Any any question on this slide? Okay. So online selection and layered graph traversal. So in the online version, we're going to have what what we want to call a sequential selector. So a, se a sequential selector now, it's a map as before, but now it takes as input a sequence of sets. And it outputs an element in the last set. Okay. So you can imagine in layered graph traversal, my sequence of set is going to be the sequence of layers. And you have to output an element in the last layer. Then I add you know, one more layer, you have this whole sequence, you have to output you know, a point in that last layer, and so on and so forth. So now let's generalize. Now I, I want, you know, I have a sequential selector, perfectly well defined. Now I want to generalize what is Hausdorff smooth selection. Okay. So I need to tell you two things. You know, Hausdorff smooth selection, it was the distance between selected points is smaller than the Hausdorff distance. So I need to tell you both how to generalize the left hand side of the inequality and the right hand side. So let's start with the right hand side. What is the generalization of Hausdorff uh, distance? So now the Hausdorff distance is going to be a notion of complexity of a sequence of sets. And this, I'm going to call it opt. And it's the smallest distance needed to satisfy this sequence. So let me define this a little bit more precisely. Maybe I should have added an equation. It's the infimum over a sequence of selected points, little s1, little s2, up to little st. Little s1 is in capital S1, little s2 is in capital S2, and so on and so forth of the sum of the distances, okay? The distance between little s1 and little s2, plus the distance between little s2 and little s3, et cetera. And let's take from the worst case starting point in the first set, okay? So you see, if I had two sets, this is exactly the unsymmetrized Hausdorff distance. But now I have a sequence of sets, and it's a natural generalization of Hausdorff distance. And you see, if my sequence of sets are the layers in my layered graph, then this up is exactly the shortest path you know, from the source to the target. It's exactly the smallest distance I can take to be in each layer at every time. Okay, So opt is a natural generalization of Hausdorff distance. And for layered graph traversal, it's exactly going to correspond to the shortest path. Now, what is the generalization of the left-hand side? Well, I think it's quite natural. Instead of just the distance between, you, know, you had two sets A and B before, now you have this sequence of sets. I'm just going to take the sum of the distances between the selected elements, you know, at different lengths of the sequence. So if I present the sequence, you know, capital S1 from time 1 to time t minus 1, okay, so capital S1, capital S2 up to capital S t minus 1, I have some selected set. 
And then, you know, I selected element, sorry. And then if I present the whole sequence, I have some other selected element, and I look at the distance between those two. OK, so again, let me just say it in word. I present to you a set, select a point in this set. Tomorrow, I present to you another set, select another point in this set. And what you pay is the distance between those two selected points. You know, the day after, another set comes, you select a point, and so on and so forth, and you pay the sum of the distances. So now, the smoothness condition, which was this, you know, the distance between selected element is smaller than the uh, house of distance, exactly becomes a competitive ratio. This is your movement of your algorithm, which is a sequential selector, and you compare yourself to the best you could have done in hindsight if you knew the entire sequence. So this is exactly, you know, Lipschitz nest. How yes, does Lipschitz? That, the, yes. The mm -hmm. slides that you're showing are very lagged. I I don't know if it's only for me. So maybe you should just click, do all the clicks. I see. You talk or just just assume there's like a 10 second lag when you do a click until it okay. actually occurs. Okay, that's great to know. Do you see we call this problem set chasing? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, okay, uh, so this when we I only saw it now actually. So maybe it's only for me. Uh, I only now saw, now only I see the complete slide. Maybe like, it's only but if it's me, it's probably also in the recording. OK, uh, I, I hope. Uh, OK, Let, let's see. OK, please interrupt me again if there is a problem with the speed of the slide. Um, so yeah, so in layer graph traversal, uh, the this layer is going to be the set capital ST that you have to choose from. Uh, and you know there is something which is maybe uh, uh, a little bit unclear at this point. Yeah. Which, I'm sorry. Yeah? Just in the. Previous sentence, you said it becomes exactly the competitive ratio. Can you explain what it is? Yes, absolutely. And what, what, or, and yeah, what would be the right hand side in this case? You explained what is the left hand side. Yes. What would be the right hand side? Okay, good, good, good. So let me say again the left hand side is replaced by this sum, the sum of the distances that the algorithm, okay, the algorithm is a sequential selector, the sum of the algorithm uh, as it you know, processes through the sequence of sets. Okay, so this is the left hand side. The right hand side is opt, which is the best you could have done if you knew in advance the sequence of sets. Okay, so maybe let me just give you a simple example. Imagine that you know you have a line rotating on a point. Okay, so you start, there is a segment, you know, maybe zero one, and the segment is going to rotate around the point one. Okay, on the, the, the right hand side of the segment. Okay, so the segment is going to rotate like this. And you have to choose, you know, a point. So, you know, maybe you, you start, you know, you are, the, um, you are the origin. And maybe the segment starts rotating. So you just keep, you know, with the rotation. So, you know, you just stay on the circle. You, you keep moving with the circle as the algorithm. This is terrible because what you could have done is to move to the point, you know, to the center where the segment is rotating. And if you move to the center where the segment is rotating, you never have to move again. So you just pay one. So opt in this case, you know, the best thing you could have done in hindsight is to move to the center point around which, you know, the segment is going to be rotating. But you as the algorithm, you didn't know that. So maybe you're going to follow the circle and, you know, you will keep moving. So you will eventually have infinite movement. So this would be an example which is not competitive or not Lipschitz. OK? I, I don't know if that helps. And the definition of competitive ratio, you know, I defined it for layered graph traversal. But for uh, this set chasing, you can take it as this is the definition of competitive ratio. You know, Competitive ratio is the best content that you can put so that you can guarantee that for any sequence of sets in the set system that you have specified, the total distance that your algorithm travels is less than L times the best you could have done in hindsight. OK? So this is the definition of competitive ratio. So what, what were the sets? What were the sets in the example that you gave? OK, OK, Ex excellent. So the sets were the first segment, then you know, this segment rotated by epsilon, then that segment rotated by epsilon. So, you know, I keep giving you this segment rotated by a little bit. This is a sequence of sets that I'm giving you. And you have to choose 
every time a point in you know the segment that I'm presenting to you. And what you have to understand is that you have to move what, what the sequential selector has to understand is that it has to move toward the inside of the segment. The, the selector is going to be the algorithm. The selector is going to be the algorithm, absolutely. The selector is the algorithm, yes. The selector is the algorithm. The right-hand side is the best you could possibly do. So there is no dependence on, okay. the, on the selector. And then you want to claim that there is a selector that is good enough, except for a multiplicative loss, which is the competitive range. Yes. Uh, and that and that this is true for any sequence of set in your set system. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. So now there is something which is a little bit maybe not easy to really understand, which is in layered graph traversal, the ground set is a graph that you're going to traverse, but you don't know this graph, right? This graph is going to be revealed to you sequentially. So how are we going to apply this, you know, set chasing if the ground set is not fixed? Well, the, the thing is, this is a major difficulty of layered graph traversal, and that's why this presentation is going to be about simpler problems than layered graph traversal. And I will come back to layered graph traversal towards the end. But the way you can think about it is either that the background metric space is not fixed and that you're discovering, but this is not mathematically precise. Or alternatively, if you want it to be mathematically precise, it's simply that the background metric space, X, the ground set, is simply the metric space that contains all finite metric spaces. OK, so it's a. If you want, the difficulty of layered graph traversal is that it's a very nasty problem where the ground set is, you know, uh, the Urison metric space of all finite metric spaces. So it's very difficult to chase sets when this background space is very, very large. Okay. And let me say the, the, defi the defining characteristic of the set system in layered graph traversal is that the sets are of size k. That's it. OK, so layered graph traversal for me is fully equivalent to chasing sets of size k in an arbitrary metric space. OK, so this is really, you know, like our goal is to, to chase sets of size k in an arbitrary metric space, but we're going to, you know, build up to it. We're going to chase simpler things before. So maybe, you know, the first thing to start is, OK, the, there is this crazy difficulty that the background metric space is, you know, very, very large. What about the simpler case where the background metric space is a finite metric space? It's just a simple graph. It's fixed. It's of size n. And I want to chase maybe arbitrary set in that space. Let's start with that. OK? So that's what we're going to do now for the, I mean, the next slide. OK? So this is set chasing in a finite metric space. And again, this was introduced, in fact, 30 years ago uh, under a different name by Borden, Lineal, and Sachs, and they made the following uh, very striking conjecture. They conjectured that for any metric space of size n, OK, so for any metric space of size n, the competitive ratio, the best competitive ratio that you can get is of order log n, OK? And it's theta of log n, so both upper and lower bound. OK, you so mean, this is uh, here the, the metric space is given to you. Yes, exactly. So this is a simpler problem in a way. You know, the, the metric space is given to you. Exactly. So this is still a conjecture. We don't know how to solve this problem. OK. Uh, it's finite. Say, say again. Oh, it's finite. There it's finite. It's finite. Yes. OK. So this yes. is a problem called the metrical task system, right? Yes. And I, I'm going to explain metrical task system just at the end of this slide, the terminology and how it relates. Yeah, absolutely. This is called metrical task system. I will explain that. So there has been a lot of work on this problem. It's a, uh, I mean, uh, you can see it's like so basic. You know, it's chasing arbitrary sets uh, in in a metric space of size n. And as I will explain, it's this metrical task system, which is also you know uh, a very insightful terminology. So let me tell you what we know about this problem. So we know an almost matching lower bound. So this is this beautiful work by Bartal, Linear, Mendel, and Naur, and Bartal, Bolobash, and Mendel which is related to metric Ramsey theory. So basically what you went, you know, one of the difficulty of the lower bound is that it has to hold for any fixed metric space. It's not like there exists a metric space. It's like for any metric space, okay? So what you have to do is that you have to extract structure out of a, an arbitrary metric space. And that's what those papers did. Basically you can extract a tree, an HST, you know, I won't go into the details. It's very, very beautiful. And we know the lower bound up to a log log n factor. Removing this log log n is a beautiful open question. 
Now, from the upper bound perspective, there was this paper by Fiat and Mendel uh, 20 years ago, and then our paper with Michael Cohen, James Lee, and Yin Tatli, where we get log squared n. And our paper only improves by log log n, uh, the paper of Fiat and Mendel, but more than you know, improving the uh, quantitative bound, really what it did is that it introduced a mirror descent uh, framework for this problem, which I will explain. Okay, So this is the state of the art, log squared n. And removing this last log n is like one of my favorite open problems. It's really, really beautiful. Now, as Abby said, uh, these results, you know, in fact, the, this problem is called metrical task system. And I will now explain this terminology. So everything that I told you is for set chasing, but you can also think about the function chasing version. So in the function chasing version, instead of having a set request, you get a function request. You get a cost function, OK, CT. So now I'm going to use the terminology that my ground set x is a state space. So imagine you know, I have my robot, and I have to update its state every day. And the cost function is a task. So a task is presented to me, and the task is presented to me as a cost function on the state space. It tells me how long it's going to take me to complete this task if I'm in the state, you know, little x in capital X. Now, I, my robot, was in the state, you know, little x t minus 1. I present to it, you know, a new task, a cost function ct. Now, given being presented with this new task, the robot can decide to update its state to be in a state where it's going to take less time to complete the task. But now I need to trade off between the distance it will, you know, the time it will take me to update my state which is being represented as a distance on the metric space, on the state space, plus the completion time. OK, so now instead of just having a movement cost, I also have what's called a service cost. I have a movement cost and a service cost. OK, and again, now, same problem. I want to be competitive. You know, In hindsight, I had, a, I had a certain sequence of tasks that I had to complete. What was the best way to complete this sequence of tasks? And I would like my robot to make sure that you know, whatever total time it has spent to complete this sequence of time, of, of task is comparable up to a constant, which is a competitive ratio, to the best it could have done in hindsight. OK? So this is a metrical task system. I won't really reuse this terminology, but in the back of your mind, you can uh, remember that you know, if you want, you can have a cost function instead of just having set uh, requests. OK? So you see, even the fixed uh, space is not fully resolved. OK, so the next question is, is there maybe an even easier case than, you know, Arbitrary sets in finite metric space, I, I'm sure you know to this audience, everybody knows, this is still pretty nasty. Like it's very unstructured. So is there maybe a more structured version? And this is where you know my, my background in learning theory comes also. Like, you know, the way when I started working on this problem, what I was interested in is is this log n at the very top in the boarding linear Sachs uh, conjecture, is it the same as the log n that you get in online learning in prediction with expert advice? where you get a regret, which is called t log n. And this log n in the regret, it's optimal. And we exactly know where it comes from. It comes from the entropy. And you know it comes from the, the radius, the size of the simplex under the entropy. So the question was very naturally, is this log n the same log n? And you know, I, I still don't really know the answer. But now in online learning, you know, prediction with expert advice, it's, it's also a problem where you have to be a little bit clever. You have to invent, you know, hedge or multiplicative weight, whatever you want to call it. You know, this is an algorithm that has many different names, but you have to be a little bit clever. Now, there is a simpler version, which is called online convex optimization. So when you, instead of having to face arbitrary, you know, experts, you have convex convexity, then things are much easier. So what about the convex version of set chasing? OK, what about chasing convex sets? OK, my set system is just going to be the sets of convex sets in Euclidean space, maybe in RD. OK, what is the complexity? What is the competitive ratio for this problem? So that's what I'm going to tell you now on the next slide. And on the next slide, we're going to be able to fully resolve uh, this problem of convex set chasing. OK, and that will be our, our first, you know, our starting point. OK, now we will be able to solve convex set chasing. And I will try to work my way back up, you know, to, OK, from convex set chasing to chasing arbitrary set in finite metric spaces to chasing small set in arbitrary, like in, in the infinite Urison space. OK, so this is the way, the, the, the way we're going to do it. OK, so let's, let's go with convex body chasing. 
And you know, on this slide, there is one of the you know most beautiful mathematical objects that I have ever seen, which is which was introduced uh, 200 years ago. I will explain that you know uh, uh, very simply. So you know, just wait for it. So now the background metric space capital X is R D, and the set system is a set of all convex sets. Okay. Now I claim that square root D is an easy lower bound. Let's just see why you know just to be on the same page. So what I can do is imagine you start at the origin. You start at zero. And now I show you, uh, think about the faces of the hypercube. I show you either the face you know, where the first coordinate is set to plus one or the face where the first coordinate is set to minus one. OK, randomly, one of the two, either this face or that face. OK, you will move somewhere in that face. Now what I do is that I'm going to restrict now the second coordinate. I'm going to give you, you know, a subface in the face that I have shown you. OK, so now I'm. You know, now x1, the first coordinate is set to either plus one or minus one. Now I'm going to set the second coordinate x2 to either plus one or minus one. So again, randomly, you know, and so your algorithm, it has to move every time at least a distance one, right, in expectation. You, you don't know whether your, your next coordinate is going to be set to plus one or minus one. So every time you move a distance one. And at the end of the day, you know, you're at the vertex of the hypercube. You know, a certain setting of plus one and minus one. Now, what could opt, opt have done? So opt knew in hindsight all the setting of the variable. So opt can move straight from the origin to the correct corner of the hypercube. So opt is only moving distance square root d, whereas you as the algorithm, you have no choice but to move in expectation distance d. Okay, so you're paying square root d more than opt. So the competitive ratio is at least square root d. Okay, so square root D is an easy lower bound for this problem. Okay, and, and the way I want you to think about D, and I'm sure many of you already do, compared to N on the previous slide, is D, uh, N, sorry, is exactly, it's kind of like two to the D, right? Uh, you know, Euclidean space with convexity, it's kind of has exponentially many points in the dimension, roughly, if you want to think. So log N before was kind of like D in this problem. OK, just so that you have a, a mapping between the two slides. Now, here is a, a very uh, beautiful uh, result by Mark Selke and uh, simultaneously a team at, at CMU, uh, CJ Argyu, Anupam Gupta, um, Guru, uh, Guru Ganesh, and Zi Yetang. Uh, and this was building on prior work by uh, us. Uh, and I will, I will tell you why I say it was building on this prior work. And what they obtained is a D competitive algorithm for convex body chasing, so almost optimal up to this, uh, you know, square root d. But not, but notice that in fact it is kind of optimal because the lower bound that I told you is square root d in L two, but it's d in L infinity. And those algorithms they work for any norm. So at least for L infinity, you know, this problem is now fully solved. And for L two, okay, there is a little discrepancy, but uh, it doesn't matter. Now, what is really beautiful is that I can. I want to tell you that the solution comes from the optimal solution to the offline problem. Okay, so let's come back to how those smooth selection in convex set. I present to you a convex set, please select a point in this convex set. And I would like your selection to be such that if I change a little bit my set, then the selected point changes a little bit. Okay, so maybe, you know, I usually don't ask questions to the audience because usually it doesn't work, maybe, but maybe in front of this audience it will work. Uh, what do you have any suggestion of a selector of a convex set? You know, I give you a convex set, select a point in the convex set. What what point would you select? Just what what is a good uh, the centroid? Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. The centroid. Of course, the centroid. The centroid. The center of gravity is not smooth. It is not Lipschitz. You can change a little bit, and it's gonna you know dramatically move. So maybe, uh, again, in this audience, maybe some people have physics intuition. And for those people, it's kind of obvious. Of course, center of gravity is not smooth. Uh, I don't have any physics uh, intuition. So for me, it's not obvious by intuition like this, but it's kind of obvious mathematically. Because imagine, look at the following example. Again, a segment in you know, the plane. I have a segment. What is the center of gravity? Center of gravity is the center of my segment. OK, very easy. But now, let me add a dimension. Let me, instead of a segment, I have a very thin triangle. OK, so I add at the base, you know, at the left-hand side of the triangle, I add epsilon, a point which is epsilon above. Now I have a very thin triangle. But from a mass perspective, the distribution of mass 
is now completely different. Now I have much more mass to the left than to the right. So now my center of gravity, instead of being at the center of the segment, is going to be one third close to the origin of the segment. So my set has undergone you know, a microscopic movement, but my selected point has gone you know, through a macroscopic movement. So this is not smooth. All right? But it turns out that there exists a smooth selector. And in fact, it turns out that in one line, I can define the optimal solution, the smoothest selector out of all selector. Now realize how crazy this statement is, right? This is an infinite dimensional optimization problem. I'm telling you, I can solve you know, the problem of optimizing over all selectors from convex set to element in, the, in, the, in their set. Okay, so this is kind of crazy. And this is the answer. So this is a Steiner point. So the Steiner point, so I have a, a convex set K and the Steiner point is defined like this. Let me take a random direction theta on the sphere. Okay, I take a random direction. And now let me try to move as far as I can in this direction theta while staying in K. Okay, so the R max of the linear function theta dot X. So if K is a polytope, this is going to be a vertex of my polytope. Okay, so for any theta, I have a point in my polytope, an extremal point. And now I'm just going to take the average of all those points with respect to the R measure on the sphere. Okay, this is going to be the Steiner point. All right. So let me go through it you know, in my example of the triangle. So of course, in the segment, you know, I take a random direction. With probably a half, I, I give the right-hand side. With probably a half, I give the left-hand side. So it's the middle point. Okay. So sanity check on the segment is still the middle. But now what about the thin triangle? Well, you see, if it's epsilon, the base, then now it's reporting 1 minus epsilon. My optimizer is going to be on the right-hand side. And with 41 half plus epsilon, it's going to be one of those two points at the base. So, you know, it's still going to be at the center up to an epsilon fluctuation. So my set has gone to an epsilon fluctuation and my selected point has gone through an epsilon uh, fluctuation. Okay. So now maybe you might wonder, you know, how do you prove, how on earth can you prove that this is the optimal selector? You know, I don't know if there are many strategies to prove such things, but there is one which is very natural. Namely, what you show is that this selector is, it has some properties that define it uniquely. And then what you do is that you take any, any other selector and you show that you can make it more Lipschitz by satisfying those properties a little bit more. Okay, so you can kind of morph any selector into a Steiner point. And why is it going to be the Steiner point? It's because it's going to be the unique that satisfies those properties. And what are those properties? Basically, symmetry with respect to Minkowski sum. Okay, so you can keep symmetrizing with respect to the Minkowski sum, and eventually you end up at Steiner point, and you know this is just amazing. Uh -huh. So this, uh, you know, the, this optimality I think is maybe forty years old or something like that. Sorry that I don't have the reference on this slide. Okay, I will skip this equation. This equation just is a very simple way for you. I, I will just you know flash it. These two lines show to you that Steiner point is D Lipschitz. Okay, so you see. The L2 distance between the Steiner point selected for the convex body K and K prime is less than D times the dimension times the half of distance between K and K prime. And you see it's, it's one line. Okay, I won't go through this one line. The point is this exact same calculation generalizes to nested convex body chasing. Okay, so if I show you a sequence of convex set, but they are nested, all right? And if they are nested, then it turns out that exactly the same calculation above show to you that if you move to the Steiner point every time, you're going to be decompetitive. Now, just to make sure we're all on the same page, if I asked you beforehand, you know, to chase, you know, you have to keep moving in the nested sequence of convex set. The most natural thing to do is to do greedy, right? You keep projecting, all right? So you, you were somewhere in the original set. Now I give you a set inside. Well, just project, keep projecting, right? And eventually you end up at one point, maybe let's say, and you want to know, you know, what is the total distance that I have traveled? Now, there is also a beautiful story behind, you know, the, the competitiveness of greedy, and let me very briefly explain it. So the, what you're going to trace, the trajectories that greedy is going to trace, it's exactly the gradient flow on a convex function. You can imagine that those convex sets are level sets of a convex function, and when you do greedy, you're really like doing gradient descent. You're doing gradient flow on this convex function. So the question really becomes how long can be the trajectory of gradient flow on a convex function if I tell you maybe you stay in a unit ball? 
Okay. This as another name, this is called the self-contracted curve. Okay, so a self-contracted curve is basically a curve that keeps getting closer to, it, to itself. Okay, and gradient flows on convex functions are exactly equivalent to self-contracted curve. And you can ask what is the maximal length of self-contracted curve? It turns out that it's exponential in the dimension. So this is something that was not known before, but you know, now we know it. And again, it, it would be a, a different presentation to explain all of this. But I just wanted to mention it in case some people might be interested. And you know, I'm happy to, uh, you know, if, if you want to ask me after the presentation, I can tell you more about uh, this result. OK, so in any case, greedy would be exponential in the dimension, but Steiner point is D uh, competitive. But this is only for the nested case. Now, what about the non-nested case? Is there a question? No, OK, good. So what about the non-nested case? Well, you have arbitrary set, OK? An arbitrary set, remember my example of a segment rotating on itself. This is an example of convex body chasing, right? I mean, a segment is a perfect convex set. It's not a body, actually, but it's a perfect set, a convex set, OK? So you, in the non-nested case, you really have to understand this you know, kind of uh, rotating lines. And here is a solution. So this is based on the work function. So let me introduce this extra you know, um, object. So the work function is defined like this. I have my sequence of convex sets that I have seen up to the current time. And I can ask for any point in Euclidean space, what would it have costed me to end up at this point right now? And what I mean by that is to end up at this point, I had to satisfy the sequence of convex sets before and eventually move at the end to this point. OK? Now, the work function is exactly the smallest amount of work, the smallest total distance I needed to travel in hindsight, given the sequence of sets I have seen, if I wanted to end up at this point. So in particular, the minimum of the work function is exactly opt. OK, the minimum of the work function is opt. And the work function is something you can compute you know, as the algorithm, as a, as a sequential selector. You have seen a sequence of sets, you can compute uh, the work function. Now I'm going to introduce some terminology from online learning. Follow the leader follow the perturbed leader, and follow the regularized leader. Okay, What is follow the leader? Follow the leader is as follows. Given all the information I have seen so far, if you know, the game was to end right now, I could compute what opt would be. right? So follow the leader would be, let me be where opt would be if the game was ending right now. So in particular, with this work function, I just minimize the work function. And wherever the minimum is, that's where I want to be. It's kind of greedy. You know, follow the leader is greedy. It's like, but it's a smart greedy. It's a greedy that takes into account all of the information I have seen. Now, follow the leader, we know in online learning, and it's kind of intuitive to everybody, that it's very unstable. You know, maybe the leader keeps changing every time. You know, every day there is a big movement between what point would be the best. But really, if there is a big movement, you should be in the middle or something. So that's why people do either follow the perturbed leader or follow the regularized leader. So follow the perturbed leader is. You take whatever you know, objective function the leader is optimizing, and you add a little bit of noise to it. And follow the regularized leader is you add a regularization term. Now I claim that here is a good algorithm for uh, convex body chasing. You minimize the work function. So that would be follow the leader. But you add with some noise. You do follow the perturbed leader. You add theta dot x, where theta is a random direction on the sphere. This is kind of you know, this formula exactly come from the Steiner point definition. This is kind of you know, the generalization of Steiner. OK, so this is what Mark Selke introduced. It's very, very beautiful. And this works. And you can do basically this two lines analysis also works in this case. OK, so this gives you a decompetitive algorithm. Uh, Sebastian. <coughs> yes. Uh, theta is chosen each time for every t uh, randomly. Uh... E excellent, excellent. So this is very important. So. This is not a randomized algorithm. What you do is you integrate over the noise. So you take random theta, but you take many random theta, and you average the decision. Okay. But notice, crucially, this is because there is convexity. When there is convexity, averaging is always better. So for the convex body chasing, deterministic algorithm is all you need. But when we will move to metrical task system and chasing, you know, sets in arbitrary metric spaces, you don't have this nice property, so we need to be randomized. This is what I'm going to explain next. OK, so now let me uh, recap. 
and then move on to mirror descent, okay, which is a kind of the main uh, the main event of the presentation. Even though I'm almost already an hour in, but okay. Uh, so recap: we want to solve layered graph traversal, which is like chasing sets of size k in a humongous metric space. Okay, the set system is a set of all sets of size k. Seems very hard. Then we said, okay, let's look first at chasing arbitrary set. We forego this condition that the set are of size k, but at least we're going to fix the background metric space. It's going to be some uh, you know, size n graph. This is metrical task system, and that seemed hard too. Then we looked at chasing convex set, and that we could do, and it was kind of beautiful and very simple. And this FTPL means follow the perturbed leader. Okay, so the lead, following the leader would be minimizing the work function, but you add some noise and you integrate the noise over. Now, in general, follow the perturbed leader is very hard to study. Adding noise is hard. But it's much easier to add a regularization term, which is what I'm going to explain now. Also, notice that the analysis of this, you know, generalized final point, it's kind of magic, and it has to be magic in a way, because final point is the solution to an infinite dimensional optimization problem. That, at least in principle, I don't see any reason why you know the world would be so nice as to give us the optimal solution to Hausdorff smooth selection of convex sets. Turns out we live, you know, in a universe where there is an optimal solution, and it's, you know, just a few symbols to write it. Now, there is no reason why such magic would happen for arbitrary sets in arbitrary metric spaces. Okay, it, there is really no reason. So it's, it has to be more difficult, or we have to do something a little bit different. And we don't want to do follow the perturbed leader. What we're going to do instead is follow the regularized leader, which is minimizing the work function plus another function phi of x. Okay, this will be easier to analyze, and this is going to be mirror descent. Now, let me just explain this sentence of MTS is like chasing uh, faces of an n-dimensional simplex. This is very, very important for, for what follows, so, so let me explain that very, very clearly. So now we're coming back to chasing arbitrary set in a size n metric space. Now I'm going to be randomized. So the description of my algorithm is going to be a probability distribution over sets. OK, now a probability distribution, of course, I can represent it as a point in an n-dimensional simplex. I have n points in my metric space. So a probability distribution over these n points is just a point x in the you know, continuous n-dimensional simplex. Now, when I present to you a set, a subset of vertices in the graph, a subset of points in the ground set, and I tell you, you have to be in one, in one of the points in that set. What I'm telling you is that I'm restricting the support of your probability distribution. I'm giving you a set of coordinates where your probability distribution have to be, has to be supported. So I'm just giving you a face of the n-dimensional simplex. And I'm telling you, your, pro, your point in the n-dimensional simplex has to be in this face. So MTS, metrical task system, is nothing but chasing faces of an n-dimensional simplex. So it's a convex body chasing problem, OK? So, so we, we're on the right track, right? We're, we were solving the right problem. We're just now we are much more structured. But what is the key difficulty? The key difficulty is I just told you in dimension D, you can be D competitive. So now we're in dimension N. So if you use the natural you know, a solution we gave before, you're going to be N competitive. But you want to be log N competitive. And again, you know, this is a story that keeps repeating itself in, in machine learning theory and you know, uh, probably everywhere. You're changing the metric from L2 to L1. Okay? Instead of measuring things with respect to Euclidean distance and having this arbitrary Euclidean space, things are going to be restricted to L1 to the simplex. And you're also going to be measuring things with respect to L1. And I will explain that. And then you want this change from L2 to L1 to give you this exponential improvement. In online learning, we have seen that uh, happen. And this is exactly the story of using mirror descent either with L2 regularizer or with entropy regularizer. And when you move to the entropy regularizers, and suddenly you get log n type guarantees when, when you're measuring things correctly. So this is a story that I have to tell you. Where is gradient descent here? You know what? Where is gradient? I, I don't see any gradient descent on this slide. So where is gradient descent? Where are we going to change the metric from L2 to entropy? And what is going to be the entropy for an arbitrary metric space? And then, you know, when the metric space is the Urison space, what does it mean to have an entropy over the Urison space? Okay, so of course, 
I'm not going to be explain to be able to explain all of this, but I will try to do as much as I can. Abby, is there a question? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Is this uh, exponential improvement by, by moving from L2 to entropy analogous in any way to the exponential saving you get in uh, Markov chains when you, in some Markov chains where you have a log Sobolev uh, bound rather than Poincaré bound? Doesn't matter, we don't have to answer it, now. So it's, it's a great question. It's the first time somebody asked me this question. Uh, So I want to say no, but I don't know. Uh, I want to say no, but but it deserves you know more thought. Uh, so I'm not sure. Okay. I think at the end of the day, the answer will be no. But but it's worth thinking about it a bit more. So yes. Okay. Yeah. Great question. Okay. So now uh, I'm going to explain mirror descent and the template analysis. So this is we're really going to change pace now. Okay. So the next slide I'm going to define everything and I will explain everything. And after that, it would just to give you an impression, a feeling for how you everything unfolds for this problem. Okay, I won't be able to explain the details. Okay, so this slide again, everything should be perfectly well defined and understood. And it's kind of different, very different from what I've been explaining so far. So please ask me questions on this slide if it's not clear. So I'm gonna tell you an algorithm, which is called mirror descent. It's extremely general. Uh, and it can be applied to many, many problems. And I will define it in an abstract and general way. And I will also on the same slide, tell you the template analysis, which is the way you can use it in many different uh, settings and contexts. Okay. So mirror descent goes like this. There is a control function. So first of all, we're gonna be playing, there will be some game. I mean, where there is a playground and the playground is a convex set. So there is a convex set K in Rn, Again, in metrical task system, you can think that the convex set is going to be the simplex. We're going to be moving probability distribution. And I'm going to have a control function, which depends on time and on the, uh, uh, on the convex set. Okay? So at any point in my convex set, I have a control function, a control vector. Okay? So this is a map that goes from 0 infinity times k to Rn. Okay? So at any time step t, at, at any point in my convex set, I have a vector field. Okay? That's all what this control function is. It's a vector field which is time evolving. Okay, the way you can think about it is if we were doing, you know, if we were nice people just doing regular, you know, uh, gradient descent, there would be some function f that we're trying to minimize, and the control would just be the gradient function. Okay, so it wouldn't depend on time. This is the simplest case. Another case, which is already more difficult, is in metrical task system where c would be a cost vector. Remember, k is a simplex; it's a probability distribution over points in my finite metric space. Now, the points in my finite metric space in metrical task systems, there is a cost to each one of them. So this gives me you know, a linear function. And this would be my cost vector if I were to apply this framework to a metrical task system. So you can already see in this control function, I have kind of a metrical task system. I have regular convex optimization. I already have a lot. And I'm going to throw in another element, which is a regularizer phi. So phi is going to be a function defined on the convex set k. And I really think about it as you know, uh, the geometry that I want to end out on k. So let me explain this a little bit. This is going to be a convex function. So it has an Hessian. And the Hessian is positive semi-definite at any point. So the Hessian defines an inner product at any point in my space. So this function, this convex function, really endows you know, k, this convex body, with a Riemannian structure. Now, at any point, there is an inner product which is given by the action of this function. Okay? And you can imagine if I have a, a, a nice convex body and I have, an action, I, I have a function that blows up on the boundary, then you can see that I have exactly a geometry that might adapt to the geometry of the convex set. Meaning, you know, when I get close to a corner, the balls in the metric, in the Riemannian metric, they get smaller and smaller. Okay, this is the origin of you know interior point method, and you know a lot of of, thing, of uh, interesting algorithm uh, comes from this point of view. Okay, now I'm gonna show to you what is the mirror descent equation when you want to evolve. So what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna have a point x of t in k, and I'm gonna evolve this point x of t according to the control function c and the geometry given by phi, and this is the the, the equation. So I'm telling you what is the time derivative of x. 
And you know, it's a differential uh, inclusion uh, um, type equation, but let's just forget this symbol and just say equal for the moment. So the simplest is forget the Hessian and forget this NK for a moment. So the simplest thing is just X prime equals minus C. Okay, so X prime equals minus C, I have this vector field, which is time evolving, and I'm just moving in the negative direction of this vector field. This is X prime, okay? So if I were doing gradient descent on a fixed fun convex function, this makes total sense. I move in the negative gradient direction. This is exactly gradient flow. But now I'm adding two more elements. So let's, let's go over the first element here, the normal cone. So this, I'm adding this to make sure that I stay in K. So let me explain in word. So the normal cone NK of X is a set of direction that are negatively correlated with any direction going inside the convex body. In other words, this is a set of direction where if I want to move and stay in my convex set, I cannot be positively correlated with this direction. It's a set of direction along which I cannot make progress and stay in K. So what I want to do is I have my control function and maybe my control function is telling me to go out of K. What I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna remove the component along which I cannot make progress, you know? In other words, this is nothing but a Lagrange multiplier. This is exactly the Lagrange multiplier to the constraint problems that you want to stay in K. Okay. So, you know, if I had time and if I were with you guys, I would draw a picture on the board. You know, it's very, very clear what's happening. But hopefully, these few words were already enough to, to get an idea of what's going on. So, I just remove, you know, the part of the control function along which I cannot move if I want to stay in K. This is a Lagrange multiplier. And now, so x prime of t equals minus c minus a Lagrange multiplier. This would be, you know, with respect to the usual Euclidean geometry. But now what I'm going to do is that I'm not going to define x prime of t, but I'm going to define the Hessian of phi times x prime of t. And this exactly corresponds to making a movement not according to the Euclidean geometry, but according to the local geometry. I change the local geometry with the Hessian. Okay. So this equation is mirror descent. Is, is there a question on this equation? So what I'm going to do is my x of t for my, the problem that I care about, set chasing, you know, so chasing faces of, a, of an n-dimensional simplex, I'm going to track a point in the n-dimensional simplex, and I'm going to explain what cost function I hit, et cetera. And I really need to explain what is five. OK. So what's amazing. Uh, with this algorithm is that it comes with a potential. So it does you know, something to kind of analyze it very naturally. And this potential is the Bregman divergence. So it's the Bregman divergence between Y and X. So the Bregman divergence between Y and X is defined as the first order Taylor approximation error that you make when you try to approximate the value of phi at Y using the first order in information at X. So it's phi of Y minus phi of X minus grad phi of X times Y minus X. This is a potential. This is a Bregman divergence. Now it turns out there, there, there is a following inequality, which I'm, I'm not going to explain because I want to explain you other things. But you can track what is the time derivative of the Bregman divergence. So fix any y in k. And you can compute what is the time derivative of the Bregman divergence between y and x of t. And what you get, let me rewrite it, what you get is this inequality. So let me explain this inequality. The inner product between the control function and your current point x of t is lower bounded, is upper bounded, sorry, by the control function times the point y that you have fixed up to the term, which is the time derivative of the Bregman divergence. So this inequality is absolutely key. This underlies, I would say, I think I would go as far as saying everything in online algorithms and, and, and online learning it all boils down to this inequality. So let me try to spend uh, one more minute on it. So, Asian, just to yes. make sure, this inner product is normal inner product. It's not Euclidean. It has nothing to do with the regularizer. Yes, excellent. Thank you, Avi, for the question. Yes, nothing to do with the regularizers. This is a normal one. Now, let me tell you the interpretation. You know, if, if we were doing metrical task system and see the cost function. So X is your probability distribution over your state space. C is the current cost function over the points in the metric space. So the inner product between C and X is just your expected cost if you were sampling a point from X. You sample a point from X and you look at what is your expected cost. And you compare that to the expected cost of Y. 
So you, you should be thinking about why as where opt is going to be. Okay, opt is some probability distribution. In fact, it's probably fixed on one point, but it's some probability distribution which you don't know about. And what you want to say is the cost that you're experiencing, you would love to say that you're experiencing less cost than the cost of opt. But of course, you cannot say that. But what you can say is, if you're experiencing more cost than opt, if you have regrets, if this cost is larger than this, then your Bregman divergence is decreasing. This has to be negative. So, when, so this algorithm has a property that whenever you regret what you're doing, you're learning. How are you learning? You're learning because your distance to opt is decreasing. So whenever you pay more than opt, you decrease. So you know, this is the essence of, of learning. Like you know, you, you're allowed to make mistakes, but you have to learn from your mistakes. And this is exactly what this mirror descent and its template analysis does for you. It shows to you that this algorithm learns from its mistakes. Okay. So, so this is this is key. All right. So now I'm gonna explain to you how to use that for set chasing. Okay. So how do you use that for set chasing? So this is all we know about the algorithm, right? That c times x plus the, the time derivative of the Bregman is less than c times y. So this paragraph, this one paragraph, is going to tell you fully the algorithm up to the specification of the mirror map phi, of the regularizer phi. But this paragraph tells you the algorithm that I want to do. So again, my current position is described by a probability vector in the simplex k. Okay? And now I want to be in some set s in my set chasing problem. My set S, remember, it's in my discrete metric space, so it corresponds to a phase of the line dimensional simplex. It corresponds to a set of coordinates where I need my probability distribution to be supported. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to run mirror descent with a control function, which is the indicator of the complement of S. In words, I'm applying a cost to any point which is out, to any coordinate which is outside of S. Remember, right? Mirror descent, it's minus C. X prime is minus C. So what this says is that at any coordinate outside of the set where I want to be, I'm applying a force, I'm applying a control that tells it, please decrease the mass there. Now, mirror descent is doing a lot of other things. You know, as I decrease the mass there, you know, I, I need to remain a probability distribution. So the Lagrange multiplier is going to make it so that the decrease of mass is going to be redistributed elsewhere. OK, so the Lagrange multiplier is doing the redistribution of mass. And of course, the speed at which I'm decreasing the mass depends on the Hessian of phi. It depends on the you know, uh, regularizer that I have chosen. But now I claim, and this is not completely obvious, that I can apply this control for long enough. And eventually, I will reach zero mass to any coordinate which is outside of S. OK, this is a claim. Now, why is this true? This is true because of this equation over there. Think about it. Let me apply this equation over there with y, which is you know maybe supported on s, maybe the uniform measure on s. So c times y is zero, right? There is the control uh, on a uniform measure on, on on the set s. This is zero. Okay. So I know that whatever I'm experiencing, you know, this is c times x is exactly the mass that is left outside of the coordinates in s. So you see that the time derivative of the Bregman is less than minus the mass left out of the coordinate of S. So if, you know, if my mass outside of the coordinate of S remained larger than some epsilon, then this would decrease at the rate epsilon. But this is non-negative. I didn't say that, but because phi is convex, the Bregman divergence is always non-negative. So I cannot keep decreasing forever. That's it. This proves that this thing cannot remain larger than some constant epsilon. It has to go to zero. OK? So the template analysis tells me that this is a well-defined algorithm. So this is the algorithm with which I'm going to solve you know, everything, metrical task system, layout graph traversal. Again, algorithm fully described. Now, what is not obvious at all is why is it a good algorithm? You know, why is the movement of this algorithm controlled? OK, so this is now what I need to explain. Is there, is there any question on? the definition of the algorithm. OK, so now, now I'm going to move into the impressionistic uh, part of the presentation, where it's just going to be about giving you ideas of you know, what are the problems that comes up and what are the solutions that we have for them. 
So the, the first problem, I mean, okay, this is an algorithm. And what we want is we want to analyze its movement cost. Okay, how much does it move? This is, you want to understand, you know, what is X prime? What is some norm of X prime? But all you know is you know how to control this thing, C times X, okay? So I'm going to call this a service cost. And what you know how to control is a movement cost. But the service cost has no real meaning, you know? It's, a, it's really the service cost that you care about. Another thing is, okay, you, we, we know something about the service cost. We know this inequality, but we will want to think about Y as opt. Okay, so why is going to be a point which is supported on the requested set? So why is going to be moving? So why is also going to depend on T? Okay, but notice that here in this inequality here, it was very important when I compute the time derivative of the Bregman that Y is fixed. But now Y is going to be moving. So how am I going to deal with Y moving? Okay, so problem one is that we care about the movement cost, but all we control is the service cost, the quantity C times S. Problem two is that we need to control what happens when Y moves in the Bregman divergence. And again, now I will tell you, you know, some ideas of how to solve this problem, which may, may be useful elsewhere. So the solution to the second problem is simply that you want to select a mirror map, a regularizer of phi to be Lipschitz, you know? And it turns out that if you select phi to be Lipschitz, then you exactly have these inequalities at the difference between the Bregman divergence between y and x and the Bregman divergence between y prime and x is going to be bounded by L times the distance between y and y prime. But notice the distance between y and y prime, this is great for us because this is the movement of opt. This is how opt is going to appear for us. Opt is going to appear because of this inequality. Okay, So now we're going to have that c times x is going to be comparable to opt, which is great because eventually we want competitive ratio. Competitive ratio is eventually to say that the movement of x prime is comparable to opt. And right now we're, we're getting there because we're saying we will want to relate x prime to c times x. And here we just said that c times x is related to opt. So that's how we are going to stitch things together and get to, to a, a competitive ratio. Now, the next point is the most important one. This is where the entropy appears. So we want to relate x prime to c times x. What do we know about x prime? Well, we know that x prime is the inverse action applied to C plus a Lagrange multiplier, right? This is a definition of mirror descent. So we want to relate X prime and C times X. So it would be great if the inverse Hessian was just a diagonal matrix with X on the diagonal. Then X prime would be kind of X times C, okay? But inverse Hessian equals diagonal X, this is nothing but the entropy. This is why the entropy appears in these problems. The entropy appears because it's a way to relate the movement cost to the service cost. Once you have phi of x, which is the sum of xi log xi, then you exactly that get that x prime is x times c. Okay, so that's how you, you do it. Entropic regularization naturally comes in. But now notice, it's going to be more complicated than that. Because the, notice that the solution to problem one and the solution to problem two are contradictory. The entropy is not Lipschitz. The entropy, the, the, the derivative at zero blows up. Okay, so the entropy is not Lipschitz. So you can, we don't know how to solve problem one and problem two together. Another problem, very, very fundamental and interesting, is that there is a Lagrange multiplier here, which induces extra movement. And this extra movement, how are you going to control it? Nothing in this slide is explaining you how to control it. Okay, and the entropy is not Lipschitz. So let me tell you how to solve problem four. So the solution to problem four was already solved uh, by Buske and Warmus 20 years ago. And in the online algorithms uh, literature, people have solved this problem without saying that they were solving this problem because they didn't have this mirror descent forever. Okay, so this, this, like every paper has this problem, not in this terminology, but they all have this problem. And the way to do it is to shift the entropy. So you add a little bit of mass. It's kind of, if you want, you add a prior. Okay, and this prior is very, very fundamental. And I will just try to focus in the last, you know, whatever, 10 minutes on this prior and how this prior is going to you know, matter tremendously. So you have a prior delta and you're going to shift by this prior delta. And now, you know, phi is going to be what? It's going to be log one over delta Lipschitz. Okay, so where, where delta is, 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 yeah, okay. But this induces an extra movement because notice that now, you know, the inverse action, it has a plus delta in it. 
So we have two extra sources of movement. One extra source of movement is that we shifted the entropy and uh, that we have a Lagrange multiplier on mu. I'm not going to explain either of those. What I'm going to focus on now is on the essence of, you know, what does it mean for this entropy to be Lipschitz when, when the metric space is evolving? And what is this prior that you have to, uh, to have when the entropy is changing? Okay. All right. And the solution, yeah, to the Lagrange multiplier is this uh, thing that we invented, uh, that Michael Cohen invented. You know, this was like one of the uh, great pleasure of my life to work with, with Michael, you know, a few years ago. It was really wonderful. And he invented uh, this potential on a tree metric, which is which we call the weighted depth potential. I won't have time to explain this, but but this is how you deal with the Lagrange multiplier. Okay, so now there is a full picture for set chasing on a tree, and I just need to explain to you that briefly. So the background metric space now is going to be a tree. This is my tree, and we're going to be set chasing subset of leaves. Okay. Now this is a, a tree. There is, you know, edge length on the on uh, on the edges. So let, let me call W U is a weight on the edge above the vertex U, and I'm gonna expand the state space. So instead of having just instead of just recording the probability of any leaf, I'm also gonna record the probability of internal nodes. Okay. So X U is gonna be the sum of the mass in the leaves in the subtree rooted at U. Now, why do I do that? So now X is a unit root leaves flow. Okay, so it's how, how do I, I start with a mass one for the whole metric space, and I'm gonna distribute this mass you know, over the leaves. K is now a more complicated polytope because it's a polytope of unit root leaves flow. Okay, so it's a more complicated polytope than just you know, the simplex, and we have a constraint for each vertex, so the Lagrange multiplier is gonna be a little bit more complicated. But the key is that now the movement cost of X prime just becomes a weighted L1 norm. You know, imagine if I just want to decrease the mass in the subtree U, what it means is that I have to send some mass along the edge above U. And I exactly have to send, you know, the absolute value of X U prime along the edge, which is weighted W U. So now my movement is really a weighted L1 norm. Okay. So it's very natural to introduce this, what we call the multiscale entropy. So it's not only an entropy, but it has the shift, those delta u's, and it has weights w u in it. Okay, so this is a multiscale entropy. You know, I could spend uh, a long time talking about it. This is what we're going to do. We're going to run mirror descent with this weighted entropy. Now it turns out that the delta movement now is controlled, uh, and you know, fat. Okay, maybe let me say this rather than uh, showing the the, the next uh, uh, bullet points. The key point is the prior delta. Okay, this is all I want. This is the last point I'm gonna make. The prior delta, the shift by, that you're making in this weighted multiscale entropy. This is gonna be a flow on the tree. And it's very natural to take a flow which is uniform over the leaves. Imagine I have a very unbalanced tree where uh, I have the- Sorry, uh, yes. Sebastian, it's a flow on the tree or it's a flow on this convex polytope which is defined on the tree? Yes, it's a flow on the tree, which is being represented as a point in this polytope K. So, so exactly. So delta is going to be a point in K. And the question is what point in K? And I think the most natural thing is to have a point in K, which eventually gives you uniform mass over the leaves. But now imagine an unbalanced tree where I have the, the root, and then it has one child, you know, which is going all the way down. And then another guy which is splitting. And now, you know, there is one guy that keeps splitting and, you know, the other guy does not split. Okay, so I have this very unbalanced tree. And if I want to be uniform over the leaf, at the root, notice that my flow, what it needs to do, it needs to send mass one over N to the guy which is going all the way down and mass one minus one over N on the other side. Okay, and I keep doing that. And I'm mentioning that because now, in layered graph traversal. Layered graph traversal is going to be exactly the same problem, but where the tree is evolving, the tree itself is going to change. And if the tree itself is changing, you can imagine that if I'm at the root and I have two you know, children that comes up, then what is going to be my flow? Well, I'm going to send one half, one half, but then maybe this guy splits and I send one half, one half. So as I keep splitting, 
and layered graph traversal, I'm going to get a flow which is exponentially small in the number of leaves. Okay, so this is really going to be the key difference between metrical task system or set chasing with a known metric space and layered graph traversal, which is set chasing in an unknown tree, an evolving tree, is that I'm not going to be able to choose a smart flow. My flow is going to itself have to evolve. And because itself it will have to evolve, it's going to be exponentially small in the number of leaves. Now, in layered graph traversal, my number of leaves is going to be k. So I'm going to have a flow exponentially small in k which means my entropy is going to be log 1 over delta Lipschitz, which means k times Lipschitz. So in, in set chasing over arbitrary metric finite metric space, it's going to be log n Lipschitz, but in layered graph traversal, it's going to be k Lipschitz. So this is really the big difference between the two. Now, there is another case that comes out, which is that, and I, I, you know, I won't have time to explain this, which is the movement induced by the Lagrange multiplier. So notice that what is mirror descent telling me, right? Mirror descent telling, is just telling me decrease the mass on the leaves where I don't want to be. But the Lagrange multiplier is doing the rerouting of the flow, you know, everywhere in the tree. And this induces an extra movement of the combinatorial depths of the tree. Okay. So if I have a tree of depths capital D for chasing finite metric spaces, in my finite metric spaces, this is going to give me a capital D times log n competitive ratio. But in uh, layered graph traversal, effectively, the depth, the combinatorial depth of my tree is k, because I always have only k leaves. So effectively, I can think I have only k uh, uh, depth k. So it's going to be k times k. So I'm going to be k squared competitive. So layered graph traversal is k squared competitive. and uh, Chasing finite uh, metric spaces is d times log n uh, competitive. And you exactly see where those uh, things come from. Now, let me just mention that you know, something very important to understand, I skip all of this, is this evolving entropy. And I, I just want to conclude with that, which is one thing that I didn't explain is in layered graph traversal, I'm rerouting my flow. My prior delta is changing. My metric space itself is changing. So my entropy, my definition, my notion of entropy is changing. So there are new terms that comes out in the analysis. What is the new term? The new term is the Bregman divergence of the time derivative of the entropy. OK, so you have to deal with those things. And because I want to remain having combinatorial depths k, I'm going to have to have those topology change in my tree. And those topology change, you know, they change my entropy. So I need to keep track of all of this. And really, it sounds awful. But it's super simple, like everything just works out perfectly because the entropy is just is, is designed to do that. Now, let me just say, um, OK, I will say I will make a comment about a paper by James Lee, which was trying to do that also in, in the conclusion side, slide. OK, so let me conclude now and maybe take five minutes for question. Uh, I know you guys want to go to lunch, most likely. So in this presentation, we've seen decompetitive for chasing convex sets using a generalization of sinopoint. We've almost seen chasing, you know, uh, arbitrary subset of a uh, tree metric of depth capital D is D log n, okay? And in fact, this gives you log cube n through HST embedding, and you can get log squared n, but it's a different story. We saw k squared competitive, which is k times k um, for a layered graph traversal, and the beauty is that this is optimal, okay? So, you know, in this presentation, I tried to, told you, to tell you a lot of stuff. In particular, I completely ignored all the work in the 90s on, lay on layered graph traversal, there were many papers you know, on this problem. Uh, and in particular, one of them is Ramesh 93, which showed a lower bound of k squared. And you know, it's very super surprising that k squared is a lower bound. I didn't have time to explain that. But in any case, now this is optimal. So that's one of the beauties that it's the first time that mirror descent gives you the optimal solution. Usually, it was always up to a polynomial factor. But here, it's really, really optimal. Now. All of this is related to K-server. And I mentioned that for me, all of this started with thinking about K-server. K-server is kind of the dual of uh, layered graph traversal. In K-server, the set system is singletons. You're chasing single points. But instead of having a single chaser, you have K-chasers. Every time step, there is a point, a request, and you have to, to choose which chaser you're sending to that point. But in layered graph traversal, you have a single chaser chasing K points. So they are kind of dual to each other. And they face the same 
essential difficulty. So in case of the big open problem is to get polylog k competitive. And the difficulty is that this, the metric space, the background metric space does not appear. So it's like in layer graph traversal. It's as if we were playing on the Urison space. And a few years ago, James Lee tried exactly to do this evolving entropy you know, idea for K-server. But in K-server, it's complicated because you know, everything is more complicated. There is combinatorial structure of a set of servers, et cetera. It turns out that there is a bug in this proof. And as of now, it's still an open problem to get polylog K. But you know, I believe that what we did here should be helpful for K-server and eventually lead to a solution, maybe even the optimal uh, solution. And you know, more generally, entropic regularization is kind of incredible, very powerful, very resilient. You know, where else can we use this? OK, thank you for listening to me. I know this was a long presentation. Thanks, Sebastian. Questions to Sebastian? Anybody? So I have one, one question. I mean, does the whole thing uh, that you described work also not just for chasing sets, but chasing uh, uh, functions? functions? Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, OK, not the whole thing. So when, when you move to layer graph traversal or K-server, it actually does not work. Uh, so ev everything works for finite metric spaces. But as soon as you try to put this more fine grade combinatorial structure, then it doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's really for layered graph traversal and for case server, it's important that these are just sets. Okay. More questions. All right, I guess you are right. Lunch is calling. So, <laughs> yes, definitely. Awesome. Okay, thanks a lot, Sebastian. Yeah, thank you everyone.